Hey, what's up budget gamers? We're back for round two of $20 CPU testing. If you didn't get a chance, check out part one where we establish our standard of comparison. Today though, we're stepping back in time to the earlier days of the core micro architecture and looking at this little guy, the Xeon X5687 for the X58 chipset. This is a Westmere quad-core with hyper-threading, a 3.6 GHz base clock, 3.86 GHz turbo, is available for about 14 freedom pesos delivered at the time of upload, and for maximum value it drops right into machines like these. Since it has triple channel memory support, we're giving it this 6x4 GB kit of DDR3 with full system specs coming on screen right now. Now this chip actually does overclock as well as any x58 chip, but boards and builds supporting that functionality cost more, and we're emphasizing just plug and play performance this time around. Does the x5687 game then? Time for testing. As always, we start with Cinebench R15, where the aging x58 Titan falls predictably well behind its less expensive x99 Descendant in both multi-threaded performance, owing to having two-thirds as many cores, and also comes up decidedly short in single-thread, despite its much higher clocks. Generational improvements really do show up here, although the silver lining is that it's still the second fastest chip in the series anyway, out of two so far. The more gamery 3D Mark Firestrike is a touch more charitable to our Westmere chip, bestowing upon it 8800 points in the physics test. This does suggest that going forward our Wii Quad Core may hold its own in some titles, but struggle mightily in heavier ones. On to the real games then. CSGO will run on a TI-89 graphing calculator with over 60 FPS, but it's still pleasant to see an average over 200 from the long in the tooth Xeon, and it even boasts a 1% low rubbing right up against 100. It's not going to win any e measuring contests, but it's still plenty for casual play. Sutter Knight also then somehow comes through with perfectly respectable results, pushing over 140 FPS on average and keeping the 1% low over 50, which is almost worth bragging about these days. With a sufficiently powerful GPU, this game could really be turned up on even this particular geriatric quad core. In at least one game mode, even Apex Legends using DX12 sees entirely playable frame rates, with more than adequate pacing from this chip. It's nowhere near the engine cap, but honestly, so far I'd take this over something like an Athlon 3000G. In Ashes, with its massive number of calculations per second, we do start to see some signs of weakness. 56 FPS isn't unplayable really, but it's also not good. Simulation heavy games might just be the dragon to our heroic Xeon's Beowulf. And go read Beowulf if you don't get that reference. Far Cry 5 gives the 5687 a chance to regain some of its honor, putting up a respectable 76 FPS and a smooth 58 for the minimum. Given that this isn't a competitive title, the dips down into the high 50s don't really ruin the experience at all. Borderlands 3 is a bit of a mixed bag. On the surface, the average looks okay enough, but the 1% low is atrocious and it's incredibly jarring during play. DirectX 11 might be a bit better, but for apples to apples comparisons, we're sticking with DX12. Don't expect to play this or Tiny Tina's Wonderlands or any subsequent title on this franchise on any one of these chips. Really 
Shadow of the Tomb Raider gives us another result where the 5687 looks absolutely fine for a budget chip. There's no reason to think that this couldn't just crank the settings and be a fantastic experience. Forza Horizon 5 also, with its exceptional optimization, gives another totally playable result, delivering over 110 FPS on average and a minimum near 100, for very consistent frame pacing, and it calls into question how Linus got an overclocked X58 system to perform worse than this. This could well push the settings all the way up on a mid-range card and be stunning as well as smooth, but that does bring up a caveat that we'll talk about in just a minute. Last but not least is Horizon Zero Dawn again, and surely this will humble the 5687. And it doesn't. For its last party trick, the Over the Hill Xeon pushes over 100 FPS in the benchmark, and a 1% low well above the 60 mark. Again, this is another game that could look stunning with a sufficient card in the settings cranked, if that were possible. The elephant in the room is that this chip, and essentially every board for it, really only support Legacy Boot, which means that for the most part you're not going to be able to run RDNA 2 or 3 cards from Team Red, nor most of Touring, Ampere, or Lovelace from Team Green. On that sad note, thank you for watching, be sure to hit the like and subscribe buttons, and stop back next time to see how a 6-core Westmere chip does.